All right, I see everybody uh, jumping in from the waiting room. So I want to welcome everybody this evening to our awesome webinar with Dr. Gundry. Um, it's been a little over a year, I think, since we've had you on, Dr. Gundry, and yeah. so excited to have you back. Um, I'll give you guys just a little background on Dr. Gundry if for some reason you are not familiar with who he is. Um, Dr. Stephen Gundry is a renowned heart surgeon, four-time New York Times bestselling author, and a physician scientist. He is the leading expert on the lectin-free diet as the book to, or as the key to reversing disease and boosting longevity, as revealed in his book, The Plant Paradox, um, which probably I would, I would guess most of you have seen or heard of. Um, in his latest book, The Longevity Paradox, How to Die Young at a Ripe Old Age, he provides an innovative plan to actually de-age as you age. Um, he practices medicine seven days a week at his waitlist only clinics, International Heart and Lung Institute in Palm Springs, California, and the Center for Restorative Medicine in Santa Barbara. Um, Dr. Gundry is also the co-founder of Gundry MD, which is a wellness brand and supplement line. So... Um, I do want to welcome you tonight, Dr. Gundry, for everybody who is um, just tuning in and, and um, listening in tonight. We will have some time at the end for questions. So if you want to type those into either the Q&A or chat as we go along, we'll save those for the end. Um, yes, there will be a recording available. We put those on our portal once everything's processed, as well as you'll get that in an email link and we will make the slides available as well. So all of that being said, welcome Dr. Gundry. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. I'm so excited to hear this tonight. All right, thanks Sarah. Appreciate it very much and welcome everybody. Uh, as many of you know, and you'll certainly find out as we go along uh, tonight, uh, I've actually been very interested in lectins for well over years now. And uh, lectins got my attention uh, actually uh, initially as a transplant, heart transplant surgeon, particularly interested in xenotransplantation. And I became very interested in a sugar molecule that uh, lines uh, the arteries of uh, humans and actually also chickens and fish for anybody that's interested called new 5 ac and new 5 ac in xenotransplantation was one of the real stumbling blocks in getting a pig heart to be a usable transplant organ for humans because pigs, along with cows and goats, share a different sugar molecule called NU5GC. And I became fascinated with why we would have a different sugar molecule. And it turns out that lectins, uh, which we're going to talk about today, are plant proteins that seek out specific sugar molecules to bind to. And it just so happens that the molecule that exists in us is a target for a lectin that we'll talk in a minute called wheat germ agglutinin. And wheat germ agglutinin has been shown to be capable to bind to new 5AC. So, Long story short, that's what got me interested in all this. Um, so I, um, uh, as many of you know, uh, about 20 years ago, quit my position as head of cardiothoracic surgery and professor uh, at uh, Loma Linda University and set up the International Heart and Lungs Institute in Palm Springs and subsequently within uh, that institute and now also in Santa Barbara, I set up the Centers for Restorative Medicine. And I do practice seven days a week, even on the weekends, uh, because I'm a kid in a candy store. And quite frankly, thanks to tests that uh, Vibrant has developed, um, I think the lectin zoomer along with their other zoomers, which quite frankly are really dumbly named, and I've told the company this, because they, they really don't tell you as much as what you're gonna learn from these Zoomers. So without further ado, uh, what are lectins and why should you care? 
Well, lectins are uh, present in uh, plants and animals. Uh, they are primarily used in the plant defense system uh, against being eaten. Uh, so lectins are what are called sticky proteins that seek and bind to specific sugar molecules that are present on the endothelium uh, of blood vessels. They're present on the epithelium of our gut. Uh, they're present on red blood cells. And as you read down below, really the original discovery of lectins was used in determining uh, blood type. Uh, first discovered in 1900 and the Nobel Prize was awarded for this discovery in 1930. They're also present on synovial surface, surfaces and in the gap junctions between nerves. And so these, if you're, the original plant predator was actually an insect. And the, it appears that lectins were devised by plants to paralyze in is that to us, um, to a plant, we're just a giant insect. And we'll get into neuropathy in a little bit, uh, really thanks to some amazing work that's been done by Vibrant in identifying a class of lectins called aquaporins, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. So lectins are most commonly found in the part of seeds that sprout, usually what forms the leaves. Uh, but they're also present in the hull of many grains and pseudo grains. Uh, wheat germ, agglutinin is in wheat germ, but uh, the hull of wheat, rye, and barley uh, contains lectins. Interestingly, there are grains without a hull, and that includes millet and sorghum. Uh, for you uh, cultural buffs, there is a millet-like grain in Ethiopia called fornio, which uh, also does not have a hull, and it's actually safety as well. Uh, what hopefully most people know is that gluten is a lectin of the prolaminin class. Or, uh, agglutinins were what were used to agglutinate red blood cells and whatever to agglutinate and clump red blood cells. Interestingly, uh, many of you know COVID-19. Uh, people who carry type A have not only a different sugar molecule on their red blood cells, but that sugar molecule exists on the epithelium uh, lining the respiratory and GI tracts of type A's that uh, COVID-19, along with other co coronaviruses, is much more attracted to stick uh, than a type O with a different sugar molecule. And it's actually this blood type sugar molecule that explains why people with type A uh, are much more susceptible in general to viral uh, infections and viral illnesses. So um, lectins actually have a, have a history in helping us identify this. The agglutinin class of lectins uh, also includes most of the hemagglutinins that are present in beans and legumes, and, and we'll get into that in a little bit. One thing that's interesting about wheat germ agglutinin, most lectins are actually very large proteins. And in general, they cannot get across a uh, intact gut wall. We'll go into more of that in just a little bit, but wheat germ agglutinin and aquaporins are actually very tiny lectins and they can easily Across the gut uh, without having a leaky gut, which is one of the reasons I think wheat germ agglutinin is much more mischievous than it's given credit for. Okay, so the most common source of lectins in our diet 
are legumes, grains, and the nightshade family. Now, the nightshades include uh, all peppers, bell peppers, tomatoes, potatoes, goji berries, tobacco, and tomatillos. Most of the lectins are found in the peels and the seeds of these. a nightshade. They do have lectins. Uh, believe it or not, goji berries originated in the United States. Um, they were called wolf berries. They were taken to China in trade uh, during Colombian trade in the, the late early 1500s, and they thrived in China. So uh, goji berries, and in fact, most nightshades that we eat are American, American plants. Uh, peanut, uh, the peanut lectin is infamous. About 95% of us actually carry a preformed antibody to the peanut lectin. And it is a legume, it's not a nut at all, and it does have lectins. Now, the trouble with lectins first of all, lectins are very resistant to digestion, uh, they are very heat stable. They resist di digestion by cooking. And that's why just cooking, for instance, beans, is usually uh, inadequate to destroy lectins. Uh, fascinatingly, and if you ever order a, and I hope you will, a lectin with, uh, from Vibrant, you will get some fascinating uh, bibliography and literature to uh, confirm uh, what I and others have said about lectins. And if you read any of my books, you'll find a, a rather impressive footnoted bibliography about lectins. So lectins may actually overfeed certain gut bacteria and cause dysbiosis. In fact, uh, there are gut bacteria that enjoy eating gluten. And there are other gut bacteria that enjoy eating other lectins. And that may, uh, makes me pause for a second uh, because clearly humans and cultures have been eating lectin containing foods for uh, quite a long time. And certain human cultures seem to do just perfectly fine with that. What I point out in The Plant Paradox and uh, other of my series is we now currently have uh, most of us a decimated microbiome system in our gut. And so uh, our gut microbiome, I say, and many others say, including Dr. Fasano, as I'll get to in a minute, uh, no longer can protect us against lectins that may not have been troublesome in other cultures. The other thing is most traditional cultures have systems for um, mitigating lectins. They use, and we'll talk about this in a minute, fermentation, soaking. Interesting, bean soaking actually ferments beans. And unless you're soaking beans and unless you see bubbling in beans, uh, you're not fermenting the beans. Um, and traditional cultures will actually soak beans for 48 hours, changing the water to eliminate or lessen lectins. Okay, so uh, lectins are used by plants to bind to intestinal epithelial cells, uh, where, uh, thanks to the work by Dr. Fasano, uh, when he was at Johns Hopkins, he's now at Harvard, uh, to release uh, zonulin. A zonulin then uh, attaches to another receptor on the epithelial cell, releases a second compound that breaks tight junctions, which uh, thanks to Dr. Fasano's work leads to intestinal permeability, AKA leaky gut and uh, autoimmunity. Now uh, they can also once leaky gut exists, penetrate uh, our gut wall, and they can provoke the immune system 
to create autoantibodies uh, called molecular mimicry by Dr. Lauren Cordain, who coined that phrase. And I think he's absolutely correct about this. So that in many cases, and we'll talk about that in aquaporins in a minute, we end up attacking proteins in our body that resemble the proteins in lectins, but have a slightly different profile, but it's close enough that we create uh, antibodies to ourselves. And I think this is uh, one of the fundamental important things to realize about where lectins fit into this problem. Uh, so we'll talk about that in a little bit. So Alessio, Dr. Uh, Dr. Fasano uh, showed and has written some beautiful papers about this, that zonulin production is stimulated by gluten and certain bacterial proteins, which then breaks tight junctions, triggering leaky gut. He's recently uh, published a paper uh, called uh, All Disease Begins in Leaky Gut, uh, paraphrasing uh, Hippocrates' statement 2,500 years ago that all disease begins in the gut. Uh, interestingly, I, I gave a lecture to a gastroenterology meeting in Paris last year, and he was present on the panel, and my title was called Hippocrates Was Right, All Disease Begins in the Gut. So, um, and he and I have become friends, but I, I think he stole my line, but I stole it from Hippocrates, so, oh well. So uh, I, uh, in my papers, expanded the view that all lectins have the same potential to stimulate zonulin and induce leaky gut. Now, I think I'll stop right there for a second, and we're just talking about lectins and the lectin zoomer. But I think one of the things that um, highlights how involved Vibrant is in this whole area is Dr. Fasano, because of his discovery of zonulin, certainly taught all of us to start looking for zonulin as a way of diagnosing leaky gut. And quite frankly, uh, I was very unimpressed when I got zonulin in a number of my patients with autoimmune diseases who I was absolutely convinced had leaky gut and they had normal zonulin levels. And to the credit of Vibrant, uh, they basically said, no, 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 you know, we've got this all wrong. Zonulin uh, is produced, but it's being attached to receptors. And so measuring zonulin may not be the thing we should be looking for. Instead, we should be looking for whether zonulin has now leaked across a leaky gut and is now detected by our immune system. And we should look for anti-zonulin IgG and IgA. And we should look for anti-actin, which is one of the tight junction proteins. And if those are positive, that's a better way of looking at leaky gut. And the minute I started using uh, vibrant weed zoomers, uh, light bulbs went off and I went, oh my gosh, everybody who I thought had leaky gut, sure enough, has anti-zonulin and anti-actin. And the great thing is, as we'll go along in a, in a little bit, uh, we've found that as leaky gut is sealed, and you can do that in most people, um, all the anti-actin and anti-zonulin is gone and your immune system can be retaught. Now it's not just wheat. And so I think uh, to the credit of Vibrant, um, when we talked about this years ago, they thought it would be a good idea to have a lectin panel. So there was another class of lectins, which uh, are called aquaporins. And the more patients I see with bizarre neurologic complaints, uh, bizarre autoimmune issues that have defied multiple centers from figuring out what's going on. Uh, these are the folks who usually end up in my clinics 
uh, about 70% of my practice is autoimmune diseases that um, for reasons that aren't very clear, defy uh, logic, description, treatment, and they end up with me. And one of the big aha moments for me was uh, not my discovery, but the discovery of aquaporins. So aquaporins are water channel molecules. They are integral membrane proteins that form pores in the membrane of biologic cells to move water between cells in an organized manner. Plants have aquaporins to do this. Plants have aquaporins that open up the cells and leaves to move water vapor in and out. Interestingly enough, uh, we have aquaporins in us. We actually have aquaporins in the lining of our gut to move water in and out of our gut. We have aquaporins in our blood-brain barrier. And we have aquaporin-4, which is usually called AQR4, is the most prevalent aquaporin channel in the central nervous system. So keep that in mind as we, as we go along. Now, aquaporins are in many of the foods we eat, especially in a number of the nightshade family, as well as in corn, spinach, potatoes, tomatoes, soy, soy, soybean, soybeans, and tobacco. And these aquaporins, in particularly these plants, show a distinct similarity to the brain AQR4 in humans. Now, I'll stop there for a second. Um, spinach was an absolute eye-opener for me because uh, a great number of people who follow my program, the Plant Paradox program, and eat the yes foods and don't eat, and don't eat the no foods, um, resolve their autoimmune issues, resolve their uh, leaky gut issues. But about 7% of patients in my practice, despite their sainthood status still have leaky gut and or autoimmune issues that have defied my uh, ability to fix. And when aquaporin, the lectin zoomer was available, uh, we found that a number of these people, spinach was one of their troublemakers. And so much so that uh, spinach, I've said on some of my podcasts that I'd love to tell people not to eat spinach, but uh, that would create a crisis. Um, but spinach is often the troublemaker, um, particularly as we go along in neurologic issues. So this is where they're found. Now, the problem with aquaporins is they're highly stable during food preparation. And as I mentioned earlier, they can enter the circulation as intact proteins where they become antigenic and trigger antibodies to aquaporins, including our aquaporin. And I think they're really one of the unique missing links uh, in our understanding of autoimmune diseases. So uh, antibodies to food aquaporins can become cross-reactive to human AQR4 and other aquaporins creating neuroautoimmunity, leaky brain, myelin sheath attack. And recently I just sent a paper that I found um, from the rheumatoid arthritis literature um, pointing to aquaporins as a cause of rheumatoid arthritis. And again, I've seen all of these uh, in, in my clinics. And so I, I think that this is, if, you're, if you've got somebody who you can't quite figure out, you, you've done everything, you've removed dairy uh, based on vibrance, dairy zoomer, you've re removed eggs based on vibrant uh, egg zoomer, and you're scratching your head, please get a lectin zoomer. So here's what the lectin zoomer looks at. So these are the lectins that are tested. And uh, these are in, I 
hope I put it in alphabetical order. Yeah, uh, barley, bell pepper, chickpea, corn, cucumber. Uh, an aside, cucumber is part of the squash family and I and others have implicated the cucumbers and the squash family in the same class as the nightshades. They're not nightshades, but the peels and the seeds um, do have lectins. So uh, to Vibrant's credit, they test for the cucumber lectin. They're present in lentils, lima beans, mung beans, peas, peanuts, potatoes, the rice, rye, soybeans, tomato, and kidney beans. Now, when uh, Vibrant does a test, they will, uh, those of you who have not seen it, will show you uh, positive with IgG and IgA, moderate with IgG and IgA, and then negative. And what I would urge you to do in the ones that are negative, remember that these are proteins that have quite frankly crossed a leaky gut and are picked up by our immune system. Now, if the test is negative, that doesn't mean that you're safe from those lectins or your patient is safe from those lectins. Because after all, lectins job is to bind to receptors on the epithelium, endothelium and epithelium, and then produce zonulin that creates leaky gut. So even though they may not be present as antibodies in IgG and IgA doesn't necessarily mean it's safe to add them back into the diet. Uh, I mean, it's good news that they're negative, but the positive ones mean that these proteins have actually been detected by your systemic immune system. Now the aquaporins tested, uh, I've already listed, but here they are again, bell pepper, corn, potatoes, soybeans, spinach, tobacco, and tomato. So there is a crossover uh, between these two, but these are the specific aquaporins that the vibrant test looks at. So uh, what do I do with a positive test? Now, this is kind of be uh, a general talk, but specifically if we have, if we're talking about a, a lectin zoomer, uh, we quite frankly eliminate those foods uh, from the diet. Uh, Consider alternative food preparations if people are unwilling to do that, such as fermentation, soaking, and pressure cooking. There's, um, there's data that pressure cooking will destroy most lectins. It will not break gluten. And believe me, I have had multiple, uh, what I call canaries, try to pressure cook um, oats, wheat, rye, or barley for well over an hour at the highest setting, and they still react to them um, quite vigorously with whatever they present with, whether it's migraines, whether it's lupus, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis. So uh, that won't work. Now, at present, I have not been able to find any data on the effect of pressure cooking on aquaporins. And I suspect they're a very stable protein that just like gluten resists pressure cooking. And uh, again, pressure cooking does not degrade gluten. Now, I uh, quite frankly used to poo poo uh, food sensitivity testing. We did it in our office with pinpricks um, using IgE. Uh, interestingly enough, Freiburg used to use IgE for food sensitivity testing, but to Vibrant's credit, uh, they now use IgG and IgA, and I have been uh, very impressed with the information that we get with Vibrance food sensitivity as an additional confirmation of these effects. So here's what I do in my practice. Uh, all of my patients uh, with their initial visit uh, get a vibrant celiac, HLA gluten profile, anti-nuclear antibody, rheumatoid factor, anti-CCP3, 
and a complete ENA panel. Interestingly enough, fairly recently, Vibrant has in introduced the um, blood uh, stick method where just a small amount of blood uh, dried can be used to run these entire panels, including the Zoomer panels. And it's been a real uh, godsend to my pediatric practice. I, uh, I see a number of small children, um, infants and small children who have uh, very odd autoimmune diseases that defy um, description and treatment. And uh, this little finger prick has just made parents and these kids so happy because it allows us to do these tests fairly frequently. So if any of these markers are positive, uh, what we'll do is instruct with the plant paradox yes and no food lists, which includes lectin removal and removal of the deadly disruptors, among other things, antibiotics, among other things, NSAIDs, uh, protein pump inhibitors, uh, and I could uh, go on and on. Uh, that's not the purpose of tonight's talk. Now, if these marker, we then retest these uh, usually every three months. If the markers are improved or if the autoimmune disease were treated, markers are gone. But if they're still positive or if a patient has positive symptoms, then we order this panel. We order the wheat zoomer, the corn zoomer, the lectin zoomer, the dairy zoomer, the egg zoomer, and the neuro or the neuro plus if patients have neurologic symptoms and the food sensitivity panel. And I don't wanna speak for Vibrant because that's not what I'm trying to do today, but Vibrant has this system if you order four or more zoomers, they will, I think, throw in a food sensitivity panel for free if you act now, as I joke with my patients. Um, so that's what we get. We then do food elimination of all positive agents including uh, any on the food sensitivity test. It makes my patients cry, it makes me cry. I'm often shocked with what appears on a food sensitivity test, but I've done this now long enough that um, I've started to really trust the food sensitivity test. So we then retest the wheat zoomer only every three months until no leaky gut or the wheat component IgG and IgA are now negative. I presented a paper at the American Heart Association Lifestyle and Epidemiology meeting in March of this year in people with leaky gut, uh, with autoimmune diseases, uh, who we followed nine out of 10 people uh, resolved their leaky gut uh, within a year. But what was striking is their IgG and IgA of all wheat components became negative. And that means that the immune system no longer carries a memory for the components of wheat. Now, does that mean that we can now reintroduce wheat? I don't know. I suspect we can, um, but so when the wheat zoomer is clear, we retest food sensitivity which almost always changes for the better. Just this weekend, uh, we had a gentleman with a terrible leaky gut. He has an awful autoimmune disease that's now pretty much resolved. He was sensitive to eggs and dairy on his food sensitivity tests. This time around, he no longer reacts to egg whites, which he was a violent reactor to before. And so we just reintroduced egg whites to him this weekend and so far he's a he's a happy guy and so that we begin reintroducing one food at a time and then when we reintroduce that food assuming the patient has no symptoms we retest the weed zoomer and or the vibrant autoimmune profile and we go from there my opinion uh, of the lectin zoomer 
I'm actually shocked by how aquaporins may be a true smoking gun. Um, I'm shocked by the number of times spinach has been a culprit in some of my most difficult autoimmune leaky gut cases. I'm shocked with how aquaporins associate with hard to diagnose and treat neurological disorders ranging from brain fog, MS, uh, funny neuropathies, and even what was diagnosed as Parkinson's subsequently, I don't think this is Parkinson's at all, but uh, an aquaporin-based neuroautoimmunity, and we've had this resolved by removing aquaporins from uh, this particular patient's diet. I'll give you kind of one interesting new story in closing about this. I have a, a friend and a patient who is a high-powered 50-ish year old lawyer who has had gut issues all his life. And uh, he's had weird neuropathies and recent last few years, memory loss. And he's been told he has early onset Alzheimer's, which doesn't go well with a high powered attorney in his fifties. And um, he sees me more as a friend to tell me all this workup he's had around the country. And he's never had uh, vibrant Zoomers. And so I talked him into it uh, about a month ago and we got it back uh, a couple of weeks ago and I've eaten with him a number of times and he's a typical meat and potatoes guy. He has mashed potatoes and cream spinach at every meal I've ever seen him eat. And lo and behold, he was positive for potato and spinach aquaporins. And he was positive for the myelin sheath attack of uh, aquaporin on his uh, neurozoomer. And so he, he was shocked uh, and he actually texted me a couple of days ago. Yeah, he's been, he said, uh, I thanks so much for doing this. I've been eliminated everything that we talked about for two weeks. And I can tell you, I am 90% better. And what he said is I am shocked with how sick I was and I realize now how sick I was because I feel so much better and thank you so much. So that's the power uh, of these tests. And I can tell you this guy's been at every great clinic in this country in Germany. And it was this crazy lectin zoomer that I think uh, found it. So as I tell any patient that when I ask them to get these tests, I have never regretted asking you to get this test and a date. I've never had a patient who didn't benefit. So I'll conclude with that and open it up to questions. I appreciate you being uh, here tonight and thank you for uh, your considerations. Questions? Wow, so Dr. Gundry, thank you. First of all, um, that's certainly a powerful testimonial from your friend. And I think that, you know, in talking to various providers who have used the lectin zoomer and certainly the other food zoomers, but the lectin zoomer being such a unique test, um, too vibrant there, there's stories like that all over, you know, all over the world. And it, it really is remarkable how the foods that we think are healthy or that we've always been told are healthy um, turn out sometimes to be the cause of disease for some people. So, um, you know, you're certainly not alone in, in hearing that. Um, we do have a handful of questions. I'm going to go ahead and just fire these off and, uh, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, so here's one that you kind of covered. Uh, Terry asked, does soaking or pressure cooking beans reduce lectins? And I think that kind of depends, right? Yeah. Um, so yes, uh, soaking um, has been a traditional uh, method of treating beans. Uh, in Italy, uh, particularly in Tuscany, where beans are consumed to a great extent, they usually soak at least 24, often 48 hours. They pour off the soaking water every four hours because lectins do leach out into water. Um, but cooking, lectins are very heat stable. So pressure cooking is the way to go. 
luckily, there are now two companies in the United States that uh, pressure cook their beans. Eden was the first, E-D-E-N. And now there's another company, um, Jovial, just like it sounds, that uh, not only soaks, but then pressure cooks it, its beans and they use glass jars. Eden does not use BPA lining in their cans. Um, I've actually have a, a few patients that even soaking and pressure cooking beans, they do react to, but I think they're reacting more to the fermentable sugars in beans rather than to the lectins in beans. So uh, I do have a few patients that do avoid beans for that reason. Uh, lectins are probably the easiest of the legume bean family to pressure cook and soak because of their very small surface area. Great. Great, great yeah. I actually didn't know that you could buy pre, I mean, I guess, I guess it makes sense you could buy them pre-soaked, um, but pre-pressure cooked, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah, both those companies. Yeah. Um, another question along the same lines, Laura asked, can sprouting for the appropriate time destroy lectins or only partially remove them? And what are the times to do this for various grains and legumes? That's a great question. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful question. And it actually goes back. So the lectins are present in the sprouting part of the seed, that's what is going to become the leaves. And sprouting actually increases the lectin content because the newborn baby plant is at its most vulnerable. So the lectins are concentrated in the sprouting leaves. And there's actually some papers that I reference in the plant paradox that shows that uh, eating sprouted grains worsen the effect of lectins. And uh, I get a real kick out of Ezekiel bread, which uh, some of my worst autoimmune patients were eating Ezekiel sprouted bread. So no, sprouting is not the way to do it. Interesting. I had actually not heard that, but that's actually a great clinical pearl. Uh, let's see. So another question from Terry. Um, it doesn't make sense to me that natural foods should be healthy and have been eaten for years would be harmful. What's changed? Um, is this, do you think maybe along the same lines of, you know, the theories that perhaps the glyphosate in wheat crops has furthered our gluten sensitivity, for instance, or do you think it's, you know, maybe something unrelated? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's what I talk about in the seven deadly disruptors and glyphosate is one of the seven deadly disruptors. So glyphosate uh, is now sprayed on almost all commercial wheat, corn, soybeans, uh, canola, uh, oats as a desiccant. So uh, the idea that it's only GMO that uh, glyphosate is used on is not true anymore. It's much uh, quicker and easier to harvest a dead plant uh, that has been dried out. And large agribusiness wants to have these reapers on a field on a particular date. So they kill the crop and desiccate it so that it's ready for harvest regardless of time. So that's why glyphosate is such a mischief maker now. It's not washed off and it's fed to all of our animals and it is in almost all of our breads, crackers, cereals. And glyphosate will not only change your microbiome, uh, it is one of the things that Monsanto didn't bother to tell anybody is the shikimate pathway uh, is shared by plants and bacteria. And so the shikimate pathway is you know, paralyzed by glyphosate. So not only can plants not grow, uh, but bacteria can't grow. And so um, they didn't bother to tell us this. So even though we don't use the shikimate pathway, our microbiome do. So that's been one of the real troublemakers. The other problem is we 
traditional cultures don't have antibiotics and we have antibiotics not only that we take unfortunately but it's in uh, a great number of our agricultural foods um, even though it is technically illegal to give antibiotics to chickens it turns out that if a veterinarian thinks that one chicken in a flock of 100,000 in a warehouse is sick, he has the legal right to treat the entire 100,000 chickens and declare them that they were never given antibiotics, uh, but it was done to save the poor chicken's life. So about 60% uh, of uh, organic free range chicken on some testing still has residual antibiotics still legal to give antibiotics to uh, cows, uh, to pigs. Um, so our gut microbiome is totally changed compared to traditional cultures that have a great microbiome that's capable of defending us against lectins. So yeah, a lot has changed. Awesome. That was, that was actually a great answer. Um, Let's see, I think you covered the question about if you're negative for certain lectin foods, can you eat them? Your answer was basically, maybe not. Yeah, I, I get this question all the time. And I, I think initially I was kind of excited um, that there were people who didn't react to most lectins until I realized that, well, oh, holy cow, I've got this all backwards. Uh, the people who are positive for IgG, particularly uh, with the lectin zoomer, these are lectins that have already gotten across your gut wall. And remember, aquaporins can get across your gut wall uh, without leaky gut. And, the f and so th the positive ones, you really got to look out for, but we shouldn't forget that the ones on the negative side still have the capacity to attach to gut wall and uh, open zonulin, uh, create zonulin. So uh, I don't give people a pass with that. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. Here's a question that I know our internal clinical team has gotten before, um, and I can think of a few scenarios that would apply here, but I'm curious to hear your answer. Why would someone show antibodies to aquaporins in tobacco if they never smoked and don't live with a smoker? So tobacco can actually find its way into um, actually a number of products and it's, um, you may have, you watch, we're gonna, you guys uh, are gonna find aquaporins and a lot of other things. Um, you're only testing for these right now. And I, I think what we're gonna find is just like there's cross reactivity between the aquaporins in these particular plants and our aquaporins, I think we're gonna find that uh, there is cross reactivity between plant aquaporins. So I'm just gonna throw this out here, out there that I'll bet you we're going to find an aquaporin in kale that will be similar to the aquaporin in tobacco. Uh, and you may react to kale, but when we test you for tobacco, the tobacco shows up. Um, you, you watch, I think we're just scratching the surface of aquaporins. That's a great observation, um, absolutely. Uh, let's see, here's a question about restoring the gut, which you mentioned you know, a few times. Um, Kathleen asked, what kind of products do you use in addition to the food elimination to restore the gut? Um, probiotics, um, anything else? Uh, can I be a blatant self-promoter for a you second? You can, yeah. I'm interested to hear what your Gundry MD answer is. <laughs> yeah. So um, I have two products that we use for leaky gut. One's called Total Restore and it's capsules. And it has pretty much every one of the compounds that have been shown to uh, help restore gut, uh, N-acetylglucosamine, just to name one, uh, marshmallow, uh, to name another. 
Uh, and then uh, about a year ago, uh, I formulated, so butyrate is, is the holy grail of uh, restoring leaky gut. Um, most of you know that colonic cells uh, pretty much need uh, glutam uh, need butyrate uh, for mitochondrial energy. Uh, and in fact, about 90% of all butyrate is used by the colonic mucosa. The, you can swallow all the butyrate you want. And uh, unfortunately, most of it is broken um, by gastric acid, it never makes it to the colon. And so uh, we found a company that could nano encapsulate butyrate and make it resistant to uh, digestion. And we combined that with uh, spore forming bacteria, BC30 and a couple of others, and then uh, combined that with prebiotic. So we called it BioComplete 3. So it has prebiotics, probiotics, and butyrate is a postbiotic. And in my new book, The Energy Paradox, so it'll be out after the first of the year, uh, postbiotics are, are just mind blowing in how important they are. Uh, so butyrate is a postbiotic. And what we found was actually, again, I won't toot my own horn, it exceeded our expectations. And we had a number of people with leaky gut and autoimmune diseases that BioComplete 3 was, was the game changer um, in, in, in the program. So you don't have to take my products. Um, I'd like if you give your patients that option, but uh, so prebiotics are incredibly useful. Spore forming bacteria like BC30, which you can, which you can get over the counter. You don't have to buy it from me. I, I get it by license. Um, BC30 is, uh, it's in shifts digestive advantage. Um, so you can get BC30. Uh, but I think one of the things that's been really interesting is it's these, these culprits that we're swallowing that really need to be the first thing you go. And one of the things I've learned now from 20 years of working with miserable autoimmune patients is my autoimmune patients in general can't cheat. And every time they do cheat, um, they pay for it in one or more ways. I mean, I'm encouraged now that we have all these Zoomers and I'm encouraged that at least the immune system is capable of being re-educated by the gut microbiome, that at some point we're gonna get to a point where people can start cheating. Um, that's our, our next project. So there you go. Great. Um... So here's something that you briefly touched on, um, and I don't know if you can elaborate a little bit. I know I can I can answer this um, if you don't know off the top of your head, um, but you did touch on the dried blood spot or fingerprint collection. Yep. Um, Rebecca asked, do you believe it's as accurate as the blood test? So far, so good. You guys have shown me your data that it's, a, it's as accurate, and we have been you know, we have been using it and um, like I say, it's been, it's been a big game changer for um, particularly kids, but it, it gives a benefit, particularly, you know, in COVID, you don't have to, you can do it at home. Right. And, which and I, can, I can further clarify the, the test platform is exactly the same. So the accuracy does not change. The only thing that's different is the collection method. Um, so even, even when you draw a phlebotomy and you draw a standard EDTA tube, um, we use a extremely tiny amount of blood, even when you draw it in a tube. So the dried blood spot is just a different collection method. So for, for the, those of you who have questions about the accuracy, um, it's actually the exact same as drawing phlebotomy because it's the same platform. We don't change the technology used at all. There you go. All right. Um, I think we have time for just a couple more questions. We have a few here. Let's see. Um, I 
trying to find something we didn't already answer because you've actually answered some of these <laughs> in answering other questions. Um, oh, so the question about how recently should somebody eat a food before testing, and this is also something internally, you know, we respond to a lot when it comes to antibody testing. Um, so should, if somebody has been eliminating the food for years, um, is it worth testing for it? Should you go ahead and test anyway? What are yeah. your so I have people who have eliminated, at least as far as they know, gluten in their diet for 10 years, and they're still wildly positive for all the components of wheat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so no, you don't have to, you do not have to overload your system with these things. I think your, your system is so elegant that it, it'll pick it up, um, so. Absolutely. All right. Well, I think that we are about out of time. Um, we do have to uh, wrap up, but um, as we mentioned before at the beginning, the recording will be sent out to anybody who's registered. There'll be an email as well as this will be available in our own internal education portal um, along with the slides. Usually that takes a few days. Um, we do have the upcoming Food Zoomer mini summit on Friday. So we're going to be touching on all the other Zoomers. If you are available, um, please, you know, get signed up for that. I, I know we've sent out quite a few emails. We've posted on social media. If for some reason you have missed that information and you would like it, please email me or get in touch with us um, on our social media or, or um, email as well. And um, so Dr. Gundry, I just want to thank you so much for your time tonight. This has been so informative. Um, so many great takeaways from this and just your experience, um, clinical pearls as far as, as lectins in clinical practice. So um, on behalf of Vibrant and everyone listening, I just want to thank you again for your time. And um, everyone who tuned in, thanks so much for being here with us this evening. We hope that you learned a lot and um, have a great night. Yeah, thanks everybody for being here. I appreciate it. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Dr. Gundry. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.